It is my distinct pleasure and honor to present uh, to you the governor of the great state of Louisiana, the Honorable John Bell Edwards. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, members of the legislature, my fellow Louisianans, good afternoon and welcome back. And this time it's the Constitution that requires you to be here. <laughs> Before I get to the work we have ahead of us, I'd like you to join me in welcoming a couple of guests, true heroes. First, I would like to recognize the heroic efforts of a young Central High School student, Daniel Wesley, who came to the aid of a victim of domestic violence. One Sunday in late November, April Peck had just been shot here in Baton Rouge, pushed out of a vehicle and left for dead on the side of the road. Daniel immediately took action. As he rushed to her aid, Daniel was told by the shooter, if you help her, I'm going to kill you. The aggressor shot Daniel twice and struck him with his vehicle twice. But Daniel is now thriving after undergoing successful surgeries to address his injuries. And I'd ask all of you to join me in welcoming Daniel Wesley and his family to the legislature today. I'd also ask that you keep April Peck's family in your prayers as they continue to heal from her tragic death. We also have another guest with us today, very special guest. You know, this past year has been filled with heartbreak in our law enforcement community. None of us will ever forget that morning in July when an attack on our officers claimed the lives of three brave men and left three others injured. Just last month, we lost another dedicated officer in the line of duty here in Baton Rouge. January the 7th was another day that certainly could have ended in tragedy. Agent Tyler Wheeler, a Department of Wildlife and Fisheries agent, was shot in the head during what he believed to be a routine traffic stop. Thanks to the skills of an incredible medical team and the prayers of so many people from all across the state. Agent Wheeler is able to be with us today. And so Agent Wheeler, we wanna thank you and all of your brothers and sisters in uniform who risk your lives every day to keep us safe. Agent Wheeler, would you please stand? Agent Wheeler is also joined by his family and his wife. And next year, I'm sorry, next week, they celebrate their very first anniversary. Congratulations to you all. And now we turn our attention to this legislative session. This is my second state of the state. But since last year, as you know, Louisiana has endured more trials than we could have ever imagined. Two historic floods and a series of tornadoes. The tragic shooting death of Alton Sterling, followed by the cowardly attack on our law enforcement community. The eyes of the nation have been upon Louisiana. On top of that, the worst budget crisis in our state's history still lingering in the background. But time and time again, we have proven that there is no challenge too great for us to overcome. The heart of Louisiana is its people. And I saw that 
in the neighborhoods I walked following the floods, and in the men and women and children who came together peacefully to pray for our state last summer. Those are the people we are here to serve. Today, as we continue to recover from the historic floods in March and August of 2016, the homeowner rebuilding process is underway. We have 300 homeowners now who have participated in the, I'm sorry, 3,000 homeowners today who have participated in the survey that was the precondition for accessing help under this homeowners program, and that happened today. Homeowners have the ability to apply for funding that will allow them to return to their homes. And yes, we are still seeking an additional $2 billion to help our citizens to fully recover. And we have a long road ahead of us. And the path to success in all things must be driven by putting the people of Louisiana first. And to do that, we simply must work together. There is no other way to make Louisiana the state we all know that it can be. I refuse to allow governing the state of Louisiana to look anything like what's going on in Washington. It's not working for them, and it won't work for us. There's too much at stake for us to let partisanship get in the way, and none of us should tolerate that. In the Old Testament, Isaiah was dealing with a task similar to ours. His nation was at a crisis. The old ways just weren't working anymore. And speaking with words given to him by the Lord, he said, learn to do good and seek justice, correct oppression, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now. Let us reason together. Let that be our clarion call today. Let us reason together. And already we've begun to reason together for the good of the people of Louisiana. I ran for governor the same reason I suspect many of you ran for office, because you want to make a real difference in the lives of the people of our great state. We are doing that right now in a number of ways. The clearest example probably is our effort to create a healthier Louisiana. You've heard me talk a lot over the past year about Medicaid expansion, but I cannot overstate how important this decision has been for our state and our people. The numbers should speak for themselves. Nearly 417,000 individuals have received health coverage through Medicaid expansion. These are the working poor more than 77,000 of these individuals have received preventive care services since coverage began last July 1st, many seeing doctors for the first time in years. <laughs> these numbers include more than 6,200 patients receiving breast cancer screenings, resulting in 95 career diagnosed, I'm sorry, cancer diagnoses. 7,500 colon cancer screenings, resulting in nearly 2,200 patients having precancerous polyps removed, and 74 diagnosed with cancer, and nearly 6,400 patients being diagnosed with diabetes or hypertension. Louisiana's uninsured rate has dropped from 22% in 2013 to below 12.5% a nearly 43% drop in the uninsured rate. One of the greatest drops in uninsured rates in the entire country, and it is the lowest rate on record here in Louisiana. In the process of doing all this, Louisiana is projected to save nearly $200 million in the first year alone, and we're projected to save more than $300 million in the next fiscal year because of Medicaid expansion. And that's money we have to use to better fund critical priorities such as TOPS and higher education. But at the end of the day, 
It's not the numbers that have made Medicaid expansion the right choice for Louisiana. It's the people. People like Monica Calderon from New Orleans, a student at UNO. I expected to introduce all of you to Monica today. She's studying music in New Orleans with the hopes of specializing in music therapy. After suffering through severe headaches, she learned that she had a brain mass and would need surgery. The day before her surgery, she applied for Medicaid under the expansion. And after the surgery, the doctors told her that she had glioblastoma, an aggressive type of brain cancer. She, re she received Medicaid approval three days after her surgery. And Monica told me that without Medicaid coverage, she didn't know how she would have paid for all the medicines and the treatment that she would need. Monica couldn't be here today with us because she's undergoing an MRI scheduled by her doctors. But you should know that these are the testimonies I hear every single day when I'm visiting with folks across our great state. These stories wouldn't be possible without Medicaid expansion. And the same Catholic Christian faith that leads me to be pro-life on the issue of abortion also informs my position on Medicaid expansion because in a very real and significant way, it is literally saving the lives of our working poor brothers and sisters. Our state has reaped tremendous benefits from Medicaid expansion. We're getting more people the treatment they need and it doesn't just benefit the individuals, it benefits their families too. And I wanna recognize Dr. Rebecca Gee, Secretary of the Department of Health for the excellent way in which she and her department have handled Medicaid expansions rollout. <laughs> and our successes don't end there. The charge I mentioned earlier about reasoning together also noted defending the fatherless. I am proud to say that was a sentiment shared by many this past year. Thanks to the hard work of Secretary Marquita Walters and her team at the Department of Children and Family Services, 735 Louisiana foster children found permanent homes last year, the most of any year on record. Her team accomplished this feat despite the fact that DCFS has faced deep cuts over the last several years with fewer employees working longer hours. We've also worked hard to make Louisiana a more attractive place to work and do business. We live in one of the, leading, the world's leading destinations for new business expansion and relocation projects. We are defining what the 21st century economy looks like right here in Louisiana. All you have to do is consider the 21 billion dollars in capital investments made in Louisiana over the past year to know that we're creating a more vibrant, diverse economy. And this figure doesn't include the $1.1 billion capital investment we're announcing today in Louisiana. Our guiding principle should always be promoting a Louisiana that works for the people. That is why we revamped our industrial tax exemption program so that local governments have a seat at the table I've heard from many of you and the people in this state that we simply cannot give away taxpayer dollars without having accountability for results that bring good jobs to Louisiana. And the reforms to the ITEP program have done just that. We've ensured that any incentives would be tied to job creation and job retention so that both competition and incentives remain strong. And as you all know, we've been working to stabilize our budget while protecting critical state services. We were successful in protecting K-12 education and minimizing cuts to higher education and our safety net hospitals. We've ended the practice of dishonest budgeting and faced the harsh realities of our state's budget situation. We've laid the foundation for necessary long-term reforms that we all agreed we needed last year when the legislature, when you, created the task force to study the state's budget and tax structure. 
Well, the day for the long-term reform we all know is needed has arrived. It is by far one of the most critical missions that we have as leaders of this state. As you're all aware, yeah, that's worthy of, of some applause. As you're all aware, Louisiana faces more than $1.3 billion in a fiscal cliff come July 1st, 2018, a point when a significant amount of revenue disappears and expensive credits and exemptions return to their full amounts rather than the reduced amount that they are currently operating under. On top of this cliff, the state is facing a $440 million shortfall for next year that we need to fund the priorities our constituents have asked for, such as TOPS, improved roads and bridges, and better funding for K-12 education. So this is our big moment. The structural deficits have gone on for too long. The resistance to doing what is right and necessary to fix this problem once and for all is no longer acceptable. Last year, you created a task force that spent months studying the most responsible way to reform our tax and budget structure. What we found from this review is that the options are no easier or even substantially different than the ones we've considered in the past. There are many meaningful reforms recommended by the task force that we should all consider. So first, let me tell you, I fully support the task force's recommendations for stru structural tax reform. Many of the recommendations of the task force were the very same solutions I proposed last year. These recommendations are the clearest path to eliminating the deficits that have plagued our state year after year after year. However, Many of you have suggested that the several of the task force primary recommendations simply are not achievable and that you will not support the plan. So now we have a choice. We can simply go down the same road we've traveled time and again, hoping for different results. Or we can chart a new path, a path that broadens our tax base, reduces tax rates, and reduces and eliminates wasteful credits and exemptions. A path that achieves stability, predictability, and fairness. As you know, I proposed a detailed comprehensive plan that will provide the stability and predictability we've been lacking in Louisiana for years, while incorporating many of the recommendations proposed by the task force. We can drastically reform the way we budget each year by withholding 2% of the revenue forecasted by the Revenue Estimating Conference to address our emergency needs in times of disaster and to avoid mid-year cuts. This has never been done in Louisiana, and we should all support this reform and allow its implementation when the state's revenues are stabilized and sufficient. As a guiding principle, I propose that we move forward with the elimination of the fifth penny of sales tax as scheduled on July 1st, 2018, clean the remaining pennies, model our sales tax structure utilizing best practices from other states. In addition, I'm asking you all to give 90% of the citizens of Louisiana an income tax cut and simplify the corporate tax structure by reducing the current five corporate income tax rates to three lower rates. Both of these shifts would be in exchange for eliminating the deductibility of federal income taxes, a practice that is used in only three other states and is most beneficial to the higher income earners. The most significant part of this plan is in response to a problem we should all acknowledge, that our corporate income tax structure is broken. It is far too unstable and is laden with credits, exemptions, and deductions that put too much of the burden of funding critical state services on individuals in the middle class. If there are those of you that disagree with that premise, then I challenge you to defend what I'm about to tell you. In 2015, in that fiscal year, 80% of Louisiana corporations did not pay any 
state income tax. For C-Corps, those businesses that are taxed at the entity level, 80,000 out of 101,000 did not pay any income tax to the state of Louisiana. That means administrative assistance at some of the most profitable corporations paid more in state income tax than the companies he or she works for. That just didn't right. Basic fairness demands that we do better. My proposal will ensure that those 80,000 C-Corps that pay no income taxes do their part, just like that administrative assistant does. The commercial activity tax, or the CAT, as many of you have heard so much about, is based on gross receipts, but will be a minimal graduated amount for businesses with gross receipts of less than $1.5 million a year. Corporations with receipts over $1.5 million a year will pay 0.35% of their gross receipts. For all other businesses in Louisiana, S-Corps, LLCs, and partnerships, there will be no percentage tax. Rather, those entities will be instead assessed with a set and graduated tax based on their gross receipts. For example, if a gas station in Chalmette operates as an LLC and has a gross receipts of less than half a million dollars, their income tax, their MCAT, would only be $250. A doctor's office in Shreveport with gross receipts of $2.5 million would pay $1,500. While these taxes on flow-through entities, as they are called, would be new, they would also be fixed and minimal. It's to ensure that these businesses only pay their fair share for using Louisiana's roads and bridges and for having their employees educated and trained in our schools and universities. <laughs> this broadens the base of our business income tax system to ensure that everyone pays their fair share. As I have said to you all in announcing this plan, I'm open to dialogue. I am open to compromise. We can find a balance of spending cuts and revenue that help us fund our priorities. However, in the almost 15 months that I've been in office, only a minimal amount of cuts in services beyond the $500 million that I have put on the table have been made by the legislature. Criticism is only as valuable as the input and the action that follow it but we have seen very little constructive input and practically no constructive action. It just isn't helpful. We cannot continue down the path we are currently on. It is unsustainable for our state. And we can't keep moving the goalposts because it might be politically advantageous. If there's a better idea out there, let's see it. Don't hide it. Let's debate. A lot of folks are fond of using buzzwords like cut spending, do more with less, tighten our belt, less revenue, we must reduce the size of government. I'm willing to bet that almost all of you sitting here today have said one of those things in the past. And they're all fair statements. And in many cases, I agree with you. We all want lower taxes and a more efficient state government. We would all prefer to preside over a state with surpluses and not deficits. But when you make those sorts of statements, you're only telling half the story if you don't follow them up with the next piece of the equation, which spells out the consequences of what you mean. Exactly what is it you intend to cut? What college or hospital do you want to close? What road in your district that you'd rather not see built or repaved? Or perhaps the pediatric mental health program in your community that you want eliminated because when you repeatedly make those statements without addressing the consequences to people's lives, you simply turn them into political sound bites. And ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, we cannot deliver critical state services on political sound bites. I have traveled this state over the last couple of months holding meetings where every single member of this body was invited to attend. 
Most of you did, and thank you. But we've got to have a serious conversation about how to move this state forward, and then we must act. If not, the people of Louisiana are going to have some tougher days ahead. So now you have the option to choose. Accept the recommendations of the task force, accept the alternative proposal, proposal that I have laid before you, or advance your own plan, or be willing to endorse specific cuts that will be necessary if you take a cut-only approach, and then vote for those cuts. I can respect that. What I cannot respect is voting no on everything without offering your own proposal. And should you do that, understand you'll be responsible for defending those cuts to our constituents. My plan, as outlined, will make us, will allow us, I should say, to make the necessary investments to fully fund TOPS for our young adults, to help better fund critical transportation priorities, and to provide for further resources for K-12 education. <laughs> to be clear, I will work with you to strategically make further budget cuts so long as our critical priorities are adequately funded. That will be impossible, though, if we don't responsibly address, address the fiscal cliff that is looming. With all the tough choices that need to be made this session, I'll understand how easy it might be to delay addressing the needs of our neglected infrastructure. But as governor, and even before then, I made a promise that we would get serious about improving transportation. This year, we put trust back into the Transportation Trust Fund by only using infrastructure dollars for their intended purpose. Keeping $72 million in the Transportation Trust Fund that was scheduled to go to the Louisiana State Police. We also changed the way we approach capital outlay so that it's more realistic and transparent and focused on our priorities. And we worked incredibly hard to secure federal funding, bringing your federal tax dollars home to further chip away at our $13 billion backlog of infrastructure projects. And now we have a comprehensive report from the Transportation Task Force on how we can maintain our existing system while investing in projects that will keep Louisiana competitive. The buck can't stop there. Louisiana is ranked last in the nation for state investment in transportation. One of the problems, the biggest problem, is that the value of our gas tax has plummeted over the years. There's not been an increase in state fuels tax revenue since 1989, resulting in a 56% reduction in buying power due to the erosion of inflation. We've got to start I'm sorry, we've got to restore the value of our gas tax if we expect to make any headway on improving our infrastructure. Otherwise, we'll continue to lag behind and our roads and bridges will be less safe and clogged with traffic congestion. In fact, you should know, without an infusion of $40 million next year from the State General Fund, we will not be eligible for $200 million in federal transportation funds. And over time, the problem gets worse, not better. In the coming weeks, you will have the opportunity to consider many of the task force's proposals. Secretary Sean Wilson and his team have crisscrossed this state soliciting your input on how to improve our infrastructure. I urge you to take a serious look at what we can do together to better invest in our state's roads, bridges, and ports going forward. One of the easiest decisions you can make this session is passing the 2017 Coastal Master Plan and the Coastal Annual Plan. As you know, we're in a race against time to save our coast, and the difference between success and failure lies in the quickness of our response and the boldness of our actions. This plan uses science to meet our challenges head on. As all of you know, I'm also asking that we work together to make Louisiana smart on crime. 
you don't need me to tell you that what we're doing now is not working for our state. Louisiana has the highest incarceration rate in the country, and we lock people up at a rate of nearly twice the national average. As I have said time and time again, it's not because our people are more sinister than citizens of other states. We know that's not the case. Our crime rates are comparable to other southern states that have much lower incarceration rates. As citizens, we have a responsibility to uphold the law or live with the consequences for failing to do so. But as elected officials, we also have an obligation to acknowledge when an aspect of our government is broken and we, we must work together to find a solution. In 2015, we made a commitment to re-engineer our criminal laws. It's an initiative that began before I assumed this office, but one I believed in and supported when I was sitting here in this chamber. We have known for years that effecting real change to Louisiana's approach to criminal justice would require extensive research into how we classify crimes, especially nonviolent crimes, and what we tell judges about how to sentence offenders and also exhaustive discussion about how we can actually accomplish change and enhance the safety of our citizens. The task force we created has completed the most comprehensive study of sentencing and corrections practices this state has ever seen. The recommendations they have provided us are largely modeled after what has worked in other Southern conservative states. This includes cleaning up our criminal code and safely broadening probation eligibility within the discretion of the Probation and Parole Board. Their recommendations significantly also call on us to strengthen community-based alternatives to prison, address barriers to successful reentry that have long been ignored, and reinvest savings into practices and programs that we know will reduce recidivism and support victims. If adopted into law, this package will safely reduce our prison population by 13%, and it will save taxpayers over $300 million over the next decade. Savings, <laughs> savings we can and must reinvest into our efforts. That last part, reinvestment, is critically important. We spend a lot of time talking about the length of a prison sentence, as well we should. But what we don't focus on enough is how that sentence is being spent. When we give prisoners the resources they need to turn their lives around before returning to society, we do more than just reduce recidivism. With proper resources, education, and support, we give offenders a better chance of successfully contributing to their community once they get out of prison. And we ensure there will be fewer victims of crime in the future. Finally, I urge you to act on the wishes of a majority, an overwhelming majority of Louisianans, by supporting equal pay and raising the minimum wage. We should all be offended. We should all be offended that Louisiana has the highest gender wage gap in the country, with women making only 66 cents for every dollar that a man makes. It's a simple and unassailable idea. Pay a woman who has the same job and similar qualifications the same you would pay a man. It is that simple. I'm the father of two daughters. Many of you have daughters of your own. But regardless, we should all want all of our daughters and sisters and wives and mothers to be treated fairly for their hard work. And it is a fairness issue, but it is also a family issue. When a mother goes to the grocery store to buy a gallon of milk, it doesn't cost 33% less because she's a woman. <laughs> the legislation I'm proposing would help eliminate pay secrecy by prohibiting employers from taking actions against employees for inquiring about, discussing, or disclosing their wages 
for another employee's wages. Let's truly put our citizens first. Also, by making a modest but meaningful increase to the minimum wage. <laughs> Louisiana is one of only five states that have not adopted a state minimum wage. 40% of Louisiana working families do not earn enough to cover basic monthly expenses. It's time. No, it's past time for us to change that. What we're proposing to do is to increase the minimum wage to $8.50 over a two-year period. It is a simple change that will produce countless benefits. Mark Twain once said, the Mississippi River will always have its own way. No engineering skill can persuade it to do otherwise. Engineering feats have certainly come a long way since Mark Twain's day. But that sentiment remains the same today. Over the past year, we faced a humbling reminder of the power of Mother Nature. There will always be factors we cannot control, challenges that we cannot predict. That's part of what has made our faith so strong here in Louisiana. But here in these chambers, we do hold the power to shape our future. Washington has become too much like that river, stubborn and set in its own ways. But it doesn't have to be that way here in Baton Rouge. Louisiana's uniqueness has always been our greatest source of strength. We are unique in our culture. We are unique in the natural resources God has blessed us with and the challenges that represents. Can't we also be unique in the way that we govern? I believe that the people of Louisiana who put us here in the first place expect more of us than business as usual. They expect us to be as strong and as hardworking and as innovative and as courageous as they are, even in the face of great challenges. In times like these, nobody can be satisfied with merely naming highways and creating prestigious uh, prestige license plates. We have to do more. We have to be serious. We have to be courageous. Just like in the book of Isaiah, our constituents expect us to reason together. They deserve a government that reasons together. And we cannot waste this opportunity. If we don't reason together, we're going to end up right back here with a needless and costly special session where the options won't be any better than they are now. Both you and I have a shared goal for our state, but too often politics and partisanship blur the path that gets us to that goal. I have been and continue to be willing to work with each and every one of you to ensure that we do right by the people that sent us here. But that is only possible if we leave cynicism at the door and look past the next election. We can get the job done. We can get it done right. We have to. And I'm ready to partner with all of you to see that we do just that. God bless you all. And God bless the great state of Louisiana.